Welcome back everyone to Gay Tale Crafts. I'm Sarah Scully and today I'm here again uh, with our friend Scott Russell, the homebrew guru, and we're going to talk a little bit about today's uh, brew session. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. <laughs> um, me too. I, brewed, I haven't brewed with you guys in ages. It's been no, I think a couple you, brewed years. With, you brewed with Rick At a least couple times. Three or four I don't know times, that I've been that involved you are here. in any of these. Yeah, so... Um, so anyway, so we're brewing a beer today, um, and we're going to share the recipe um, with those of you who are on our newsletter mailing list. So if you want this recipe and all the details, um, do sign up for our newsletter. We promise not to spam you. Um, but we asked Scott to come up with a Vermont-based recipe, um, and so tell us a little bit about this without giving away too many secrets. Without giving away too many secrets, <laughs> right? We want to tease here. Um, you know, the the one of the trends, of course, in craft brewing lately has been mm -hmm. what they're calling the New England IPA, mm -hmm. which is less, you know, deep bitterness like a West Coast IPA, and most of the hops end up as aroma. Mm -hmm. So very aroma forward, very fruity, very juicy is the term we use. And they often end up hazy because there's so much of a late edition hop that mm -hmm. the resins stay in the, you know, yeah. in the beer, and it just gives it a hazy look. So we're shooting for something like that, but by mm -hmm. calling it a Vermont IPA, we're adding a little bit of a twist um, just to make it more unique. Right. So we will be using some maple syrup, mm -hmm. some local Vermont maple syrup as part of the sweetening, part of the fermentables. And we're going to finish it with a, a very unique local ingredient, mm -hmm. which is some spruce tips. So this one. So, so we picked some fresh spruce tips. They've been actually frozen, so they've oxidized a little bit, but it hasn't affected the aroma or the flavor. They're just, right. you know, yeah. um, just It's a nice spruce. way to capture that. Um, yeah. Yep. It, and a lot of the hops that get used in an IPA, particularly a New England IPA, do have sort of a piney, resiny flavor too. So the mm -hmm. spruce tips aren't far afield. It's mm -hmm. really it's pretty close, but it's it's a unique twist. Yeah, it's it's nice. I just smelled it, and I hadn't mm -hmm. really smelled just spruce tips before. I've had spruce beers right. before, um, some of Scott's actually, yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, which you didn't like before you tried mine. No. So my <laughs> problem with with kind of spruce flavored or pine flavored beers was that they kind of tasted like floor polish. Or you know, turpentine. There, were, there was right. so much of it that it overpowered everything else yep. and it really um, kind of coated your whole mouth. Yep. Um, but this is nice mm. because it just kind of sneaks under there. Like hot, uh, Scott said, it complements mm -hmm. with the hot flavors that are yep. already there. So yep. yeah, so mm. that'll be nice. Um, and you picked these from I picked own... these from my own backyard. Yep. Backyard, yeah. Yep. Very nice. So very local. Yep. Um, but spruce grows pretty widely, so yep. you should be able to find spruce. These are, I believe, blue spruce, if okay. that matters to anybody. Yeah. Okay, yeah. But, um, and what time of year? It's like late May up here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I, I picked these literally like a week ago. Yeah, so, so kind of mid-spring is yeah. when you'd want to wear yeah. mid-spring. And you want to pick them when they're just beginning to, you know, they, they're they actually covered with a, a brown like film. And when mm -hmm. that brown film is beginning to break up and the spruce tips are beginning to spread, that's when you pick them. That's mm -hmm. when they're at their best. Okay. Precious. Good, good tip. Good you don't job. want to use old spruce needles because they're no. drier and more bitter. Yeah. Nice and, nice and tender. The yep. sweet exactly. new growth of spring. Very good. Yep. Um, and then we have another uh, kind of concoction. It's not just one ingredient <laughs> um, over here. Um, and so it's to sort of mimic barrel aging exactly. in a way. Yep. Um, so this is what we've created. Rick uh, started the soaking process. Uh, about a week ago. Mm -hmm. um, so we have oak chips. These will go in the secondary after fermentation is more or less complete. Mm -hmm. Again, just to give it the the, the, the idea, the, the sense of having been aged in an oak barrel. Mm -hmm. And it's not just oak, obviously. It's been soaking in a, a combination of a couple of different whiskeys mm -hmm. and a, a local, no longer made, unfortunately, a tamarack liqueur, which was actually made with maple. And a little, I believe it was made with a little bit of right. tamarack larch tips, yes. similar to the spruce. Right, yep. So. Um, and that's that's an uh, a liqueur that was or a, or a sort of an after dinner digestif mm -hmm. type of thing um, that a neighbor of ours had in his stash from a long time <laughs> ago and gave us a couple years ago. We've been eking it out, but there is another company uh, in Vermont called Metcalf Distillery, and they have a maple whiskey nice. that yep. I think would be a nice substitute. Sure. So, yep. and I'm sure there's other um, companies out there yep. that are making similar products. So yep. You can get a get something like that. Yeah. So, so that's our Vermont um, kind of additions, the maple syrup, the Vermont maple um, liqueur, and then the local spruce tips. Mm -hmm. um, but for more information, we're going to do a, a little bit of a video. We'll be cutting in and out of that um, as we do the different processes. But again, 
for the full details, you're going to sign up for the newsletter, and then you get the full step-by-step -step recipe. Mm -hmm. So thanks for coming over and sure. being with us today, Scott. Well, I'm happy to be here. Yeah, we'll give you we'll give you some more information, and um, stay tuned for that, and uh, enjoy brewing. If you decide to make the recipe, of course, do let us know how it turns mm. out. We'd love to know. You can send samples, too. Yeah, sure. <laughs> no problem. We'll taste them for you. <laughs> no, we will have a follow-up video in a few weeks when the beer's ready, and we'll, we'll give you a tasting as well. So thanks a lot. Sure. Great. So it's not quite a single mash, but it's very darn near close. Lids behind you, Scott. Yep. I'll take care of that first. Yep. Still Sorry. pretty thick. Yeah, my shot. Sorry. <laughs> well, Scott, want to make sure there's no dough balls, exactly. no dry yep. spots in here that uh, won't ferment because they're just in a pocket. So thoroughly, thoroughly go from the bottom. But you up. don't want to get an awful lot of oxygen involved either, so you do kind of stir it gently. So it's, yeah, it's almost like doing a dough where you don't want to overwork it. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. So once Scott is done, we're gonna put this in here, uh, put the cover on top, and start our mash What do you think, good enough? Yeah, I think that looks great. Oh. So what are you doing here, Rick? Well, maybe Scott can explain, but I'm trying to get essentially the particulate matter, yes. the smaller bits that would have been settling underneath here, to get them back out, get them back on top here, and that way we'll get a clearer mm -hmm. uh, wort. Okay. Oops, and there's my timer, so right about time, thank you that. So Scott, can you talk a little bit about what the benefits are for a slower kind of runnings rather than hitting it faster out? Or yeah, I mean the ideal is you want about you want the outpour outflow. You've got some water left in there. Thanks. Um, how shall I put this? You want the outflow of the wort to be about the same speed as the sparge water. Yeah. You want you, know, you want it continuous. Because ideally what you want to be doing is rinsing the grains. And if, you're, if your sparge is running too fast and your outflow of wort is not, not fast enough, you end up with a lot of water sitting on top of the, of the grain bed, which compacts it, mm -hmm. which keeps it from running, essentially. Yeah. So if you, ideally you get it so you've got just as much water going in as sparge water as you do work going out into your kettle. Mm -hmm. um, just a more efficient rinse and a more even and you like to keep a little bit of a just enough just, cover just, just over the top um actually i prefer to have it so that it's just under the surface just under the surface. yeah so gotcha. you know, let it let it drain so that you just start to see the the, the, the grains themselves uh -huh. so i'm going to let that since that's a little bit hot yeah, let's let's run that a little bit first get those cool runnings in cool runnings <laughs> <laughs> No flies. <laughs> That's gonna be boiled anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Anything that goes in prior to boil is okay. Right? Yeah, exactly. That's a good mantra. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, we gotta. So that's a good mantra. One of the things that Scott we're doing here is, you, well, cleanliness is one of the most important things you can do as far as your brewing is concerned. You don't really need to hyper focus on it if it's before the boil because the boil is going to sanitize everything in itself. So we're not worried about having this open air here or anything coming in here, any kind of things getting uh, ruining the mash because it is going to be boiled. Mm -hmm. After that, everything needs to be clean. So you need to make sure everything is sanitized, sanitized, sanitized. Okay. Get that spinning if I can. There we go. And then I slow down. This is a fly sparge. Uh, as opposed to, what other kind of sparging techniques um, are there? The other technique is called batch sparging. Basically, mm -hmm. that would be drain all the wort out and then add the total sparge water in almost like a rematch and run it off again. Mm -hmm. Similar to what we do when we do the party guile, we're draining everything and then we're filling up the water, uh, the, the, the sparge water, but instead of doing a separate beer with that, then you're just draining that. So what are some of the advantages to one over the other? Partly it's convenience if you, if you have the setup to do this, the fly sparge, just because it's a continuous thing. Yeah. Um, you know, I, well, is there any oxidation issues or anything? You were talking about trying to keep it somewhat covered and also not stirring it in. If you yeah. have that exposed to grain bed, is there anything that comes up with, uh, with that? I'm not sure about that. Okay. Honestly, that's not something I've, I've 
delved in too much. Mm -hmm. um, I've just recently started thinking more about oxidation. We had uh, Carol came and spoke at our home group club meeting last month and talked about avoiding getting oxygen involved wherever possible. The more oxygen you get involved, the you know, the shorter your shelf life will be. Um, the sooner it goes stale, things like that, is more likely you are to get off flavors and spoilage. Oxygen is good for the yeast, but it's not good for the sugars, right. essentially. So um, there are several places where you can avoid oxygen. And the stirring is part of it. And, um, and for some people, it's just another uh, another tool or another piece of equipment yep. that they have to buy, that they have to manage, they have to maintain. I mean, this is pretty much you do it and then you put it away. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, if, if you're brewing in a smaller location or you don't have a lot of storage space, batch might be for you because mm -hmm. you're just taking a large one of these, getting the water, pouring it back on, or just pouring the water back on. Mm -hmm. You don't have to have this other setup here. So you can have one fewer tub. Yep. Okay, so we're doing our first top edition. Uh, there you go. Now, do we have a spoon? I don't know if we, we don't need necessarily spoon. need a spoon. Stir it in. It's going to foam up pretty good. Yeah. And why does it do this, Scott? Um, you've just increased the surface area by the the, the, the material of the hops. Mm -hmm. just contains a lot of oxygen as it goes in like that. Oh, it okay. Just, it just always does that. Mm-hmm. It's a little intimidating at first because you see it come up, and if you're not, if you don't have enough room in the kettle, or if you're not real quick to turn down the heat, you can have a, an overboil pretty quick. Right. Yeah. But uh, that seems to be fine. It makes itself in. Yeah. 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 So this is, you know, the these this would be the bitter hops. The, bit, the longer the hops are in the boil, the more bitterness they contribute. Um, the later you additions will contribute more aroma and less bitterness. Mm -hmm. So this is a very small bittering hop addition because this is not supposed to be a deeply bitter beer. Right. It's going to be a very hoppy beer, but the hops are going to be mostly at the, aroma at the end of the, the, and the flavor, aroma yeah. end of the boil and, mm -hmm. and even in secondary dry hopping and later. Yep. Right. Yep. So the next step here is that we're about 15 minutes away from the knockout and we're going to be adding some sugar and being in Vermont. We have an abundance of some of the best, sugar. Yeah, the best maple syrup in the world as far as we're concerned. Um, and a lot of, as Scott has pointed out, you said in a lot of the Hetty Topper clones. A lot of the other IPAs, you, you add some more fermentables without making it heavier if you add a sugar that, rather than more malt. So mm -hmm. that's, normally the recipes we call for a turbinado sugar or something like that, but this is our local touch. We add mm -hmm. locally made maple syrup. Okay, and explain what you mean by heavier, Scott. Um, I guess I, thicker maybe would be a better word. Okay. Right, the, the mouth feel the, the mouth feel that you might get with a very malty beer as much as opposed to a thinner body beer. Yeah. Um, and with the double IPA, you, you you have to get all the sugars in order to get the fermentables. And if you do it all from malt, it's going to be very kind of chewy almost. So oh, okay. Thick mouth feel. So this allows you to get more fermentables, but without cavity. Also for color, you're going to mm -hmm. get a much lighter color than you might. Granted, this is a little darker than you might use the other sugars. But you're going to get a lighter more effect of color on the exactly. Yeah. exactly. But this is a beer that features the hop aroma, especially, and so you don't want it to be cloying, sweet, heavy. So mm -hmm. the, the more fermentable maple syrup will right. um, we'll do that. Boost okay. the alcohol without really making it a heavier, thicker beer. Right. Got it. Well, so we want to do is make sure it doesn't go right to the bottom exactly. and burn on the bottom. So we're going to slowly, while Scott stirs, I'm going to slowly add a drizzle here. It's a local maple syrup, and uh, not I, I, I'm kind of partial to uh, one up the neighbor up the road here. Is, um, it's kind of got the terroir that you, that, you, mm -hmm. that you get. You get the minerals, you get the flavors that come from wherever those trees are grown. Um, yeah. All right, so we just turned off the flame here, and so we're going to be adding the last of the hop addition at knockout, and then we're going to be adding the spruce tips. Mm -hmm. um, and we put, as we said previously, we put them in the muslin bag, kind of they're going to dissolve, they aren't kind of pelletized like this, will make it a lot easier clean up when we move, when we transfer it to the secondary. Right. Okay, there we go. All right, proprietary blend, secret combination of hops here. Yes, remember, if you want to know the exact recipe, we will <laughs> share it with you if you subscribe to the newsletter. And there you go. There we go. Get every last drop. Mm -hmm. So obviously the hops dissolve in and will be staying in, and you want to pull the spruce out probably after about 10 or 15 minutes of, of steeping in the hot. Um, you could probably leave it in there while you chill it and just work around it, but 
and then you don't necessarily want to put that into the primary fermenter. That's good. I'm just, glad, you, glad you mentioned yep, that. I yep, wasn't you're just, sure. You're yeah. just using it like tea almost, right. just as a, as a, you know. Yeah, okay, I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, and then the other addition that we're going to be putting into this particular beer is that we've been, uh, oak, we've soaked some oak chips in the three different liqueurs. And again, you'll hear about that in the recipe. And that is going to be added in the secondary. In secondary after and so again, we'll put those into a muslin bag, uh, strain out the alcohol. You don't have to strain out the alcohol. It'll add a little ABV. It'll actually add a little bit more of a bourbon kind of taste to it. If you're okay with that, feel free to leave that. If you don't, you can do what I'm going to do, which is strain it out and then put it in the muslin bag and then just let the oak chips kind of do their magic. The idea is that at the end, we're going to have a nice almost barrel age. Um, so this is, it might be based on a very popular Vermont beer, but this is all... Well, we've given it our own unique twist. Well, we want to thank Scott especially for designing this beer on behalf of Gage Hill Crafts. And uh, again, subscribe for, to the newsletter to get the access to the entire recipe and always check back for more videos. Thanks, Scott. My pleasure.